Hello, I am so honored that the guest I'm about to bring to you today agreed to come and tell her story on this podcast. Her story is a different one. She married the man of her dreams at a young age, a wonderful pastor, a man of God, and um, her story took a different turn as years later she lost that man to death by suicide. And she is using her grief and her trauma to become a pioneer and an advocate for mental health awareness in the Christian community that really, honestly, I don't know, has been there to this degree up until now. And so please listen to this, watch this, be encouraged by this resilient woman of God who never knew this was coming, but who decided to take it, live it, and turn it around to save others' lives. So enjoy this episode. I do want to let you know that if you are listening or watching with young children around, be aware that we do talk about some pretty heavy, intense subjects. And if you have triggers with suicide or if you've lost somebody to a death by suicide, just be aware that we do speak openly about that. Um, otherwise, just be encouraged by this amazing woman. Check out her website, godsgotthis.com, and know that God's got this in the in the worst of circumstances. When when life as you know it is seemingly over, God's got this, and He is using this life in ways that she'll tell you she never dreamed possible. And so, enjoy um, my new friend, Kayla Stecklin. I just cannot thank you enough for one responding to me. I'm sure there are so many people wanting to hear from you and hear your story. And I've followed your story since Andrew was in the hospital and that mm-hmm. whole it kind of all went viral. And I, yeah. as we've talked about before, like we're similar in that pastor's wives. Um, just so I, when I saw that come through my social media, I immediately started like, following you, praying for you and watching your journey unfold has been, and I'm not saying this like in a flattering way, it has been Mm -hmm. truly inspirational. Mm -hmm. Um, I I just can't thank you enough. I can't, and I can't imagine what you've had to overcome Mm -hmm. to, to address these things, to become an advocate for mental illness awareness for your husband's life and so many things. And I'm just so grateful to you for this time. And so I don't want to waste it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, so if you don't mind just telling us a little bit about Andrew, mm-hmm. um, how, how'd you meet? What was he like? I'm just kind of unpack the story for us as to his, how his life. Yeah. So Andrew and I met in college. We went to a little college called Vanguard University in Uh Costa Mesa, California, this little tiny Christian college. And I was a sophomore and he was a junior and he lived in this beach house full of guys that (laughs) were like afraid to talk to girls. (laughs) The infamous, infamous beach house. So one of my friends was actually dating one of the guys that lived in the house with him. And so she, one day she showed him a picture of all of her girlfriends and he picked me out of the picture and was like, I want to get to know her. So we started hanging out and we fell in love really fast. We mm-hmm. were kissing in the rain after a Coldplay concert by our thir- oh, third date. Stop. Yeah, it was super <laughs> romantic. And a the year later, romantic. <laughs> yeah, a year later, he asked me to marry him. And then wow. a year after that, in 2010, we were, or no, 2009, we were engaged. And then a year after that, we got married. <laughs> wow. So, December so at the time, did you feel like all your dreams were just coming true? I did. I did. Yeah. I met this handsome, I mean, his, I'll never forget his Facebook profile picture when I met him. Cause that's how we used to like investigate people in 2009. I remember that. Right. (laughs) So his Facebook profile picture, like he was on a fixed gear bike and flexing his muscles and showing off his tattoos and he was just (laughs) super hot. So he was attractive. He wanted to do ministry, wanted to be a pastor, Mm -hmm. came from an incredible family. Like I thought I hit the jackpot. Yeah. And so you got married Mm -hmm. and did you start pastoring right away? Yeah. So we actually got married in December, 2010. And then in January, we actually moved to Seattle, Washington to kind of get away. Oh, no way. I'm from Seattle. Yeah. Yeah. So we moved up there just to get away and got to kind of do our own thing. So he was a high school pastor at a church in Redmond up there for a little stint. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
only for about six months. We couldn't stay in the cold and we missed, yeah, we missed, we were both uh, born and raised in California. So we just couldn't, we couldn't <laughs> hang in the Northwest. <laughs> so we moved back and just a few months after we moved back, his dad, who was the lead pastor of our church, Andrew had grown up in the church and okay. he was like three when his parents started it. So we moved back from Seattle less than a year into marriage and his dad is diagnosed with leukemia just two months after we moved back. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So he ended up working at his parents' church and was supposed to just be the creative arts director, Mm -hmm. but his role was um, quickly adjusted. So was he a super creative mind? Very creative. Definitely very creative. Yeah. Loved that kind of stuff. So he he wanted to do that, but when when his dad was diagnosed, he had to step up. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. we have we have pictures of him and his dad sitting in a little tiny hospital room in Cedar Sinai Hospital in LA with their laptops open, awesome. planning message series, booking guest speakers, like leaving the church from this little tiny hospital room together. And Andrew was twenty three. So oh, very, wow. very young. Very young. Yeah. How old were you? I was twenty one when we got married. So okay. I would have been twenty two when his dad got diagnosed. Yeah. So yeah. we were young. We were very wow. young. Yeah. But did you like ministry? I loved ministry. I took my role as a pastor's wife seriously Mm -hmm. and it felt like a privilege to me. And Mm -hmm. I just loved it. I loved serving him, loved serving the church. I was on staff at the church for a season as well before we started. What was your role? I was the infant through kinder director um, for about three or four years. Yeah. And then we had our third kid and he actually became the lead pastor. Okay. Um, And so I decided I needed to step away from that and just support him and raise our family and do more behind the scenes stuff. Yeah. So So what happened with his dad? um, Andrew kept taking on more responsibility and then... 2015, just a few months before his dad passed away, he was handed the official baton of leadership and it was this super special service. His dad was in a wheelchair at the time. So we actually wheeled his dad onto the stage and he had an actual baton that was engraved wow. with Andrew's name and the date. And we had the board and just mentors and his family up there and we, we handed the baton and it was this epic special moment. And then just a few months later, his dad passed away. Wow. Which I can only imagine was really hard on the church and of the family. Yeah. Wow. Um when so Andrew's personality, like what what was his personality like? Yeah, Andrew was I'm just, very I'm ahead. just trying to picture somebody who is run, you know, at 23 taking <laughs> church on. He's got to be a spe- a really special person. Yeah, yeah. 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 So he was, he would have been, I think 26 when he became the lead pastor, okay. turning 20, t- almost turning 27. Okay. And yeah, when I met him, I mean, he was driven, he was ambitious. I met him when he was 19 and he was already on staff at his parents' church as the junior high director. And he switched wow. up his college schedule. So he was only going to college one night a week and working full time. So very driven person, type A, um, driven for excellence, mm-hmm. um, liked things to be not perfect, but likes like things to be done with excellence. Sure. Um, like it, at home and also at work. <laughs> and a very, very creative yeah. mind. Yeah, very creative <laughs> mind, um, visionary. Like he always had this vision. He always knew where he was headed and he was an excellent communicator. So he was great at, at casting that vision to the team on and off the stage. I mean, he was a brilliant communicator, incredibly gifted teacher. Yeah. And just super driven, loved ministry, was passionate about the local church. I mean, he never desired anything else but the local wow. church. Like he wow. thought that's what, that's what he was going to do for his life, you know, was serve the yeah. local church for the next 30 years. And he didn't plan on going anywhere. So he wow. would be shocked if he was sitting here today looking at the circumstance. I think he would yeah. be very shocked. Yeah. yeah. So he, and off the stage, mm-hmm. he was a loving father, husband. He was. Yeah, he really was. I honestly, like our marriage was, was so easy and he loved me so well. Mm. And he he made me feel like the most beautiful girl in the room on and off the stage Mm. and very, very patient and kind with our boys. And, you know, he worked a lot. We were, we were like so young in ministry. So he was, he was working a a ton and he had just um, started getting his schedule better where he was taking at least one day a week off, um, which I know is very difficult for all pastors in ministry to have those. 
so he was learning, you know, and trying to figure that out with three, Mm -hmm. three little boys too. And he had a hard time relaxing. He had a hard time, even when he was at home, like he loved to do house projects. And (laughs) even when, um, after he passed away, we have this, had this little sticky note on his, on his desk of all these house projects that he never got to do. Mm. So he was always Always planning something something to work on. Yeah. 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 Didn't rest easy. Yes. But by and large, a very happy life for you. Yeah. I loved my life. I tr- yeah. truly loved my life and so did, so did our kids and, and so did Andrew. It was very difficult. I mean, the leukemia journey, the four years mm-hmm. of leukemia journey for our family and for our church and then ultimately losing his dad. Like it was a very, very difficult season to get thrust into as, ne- as newlyweds. Mm-hmm. Um, So there was for sure, you know, pressure and and just strain and stress from all of that. And and leading a church, there's always stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, But but overall, you know, we we loved it and we were confident we were going to get a grip on all of it. And, and Hmm. And, but when his dad passed away, when his dad passed away, sorry, I think you cut out for a minute. When his dad passed away, he was still full of vision and hope for the future and the church you feel like? Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah. He, he barely took any time off to grieve. He only took like two weeks off and then came back and did this powerful series on heaven. Wow. He wanted, yeah, he wanted to lead the church and himself, I think, um, Mm -hmm. through the pain. So, so as he's walking through it, he's leading the people he really loves through it too. Exactly. And that's thousands at that point, right? Of Mm -hmm. people. Yep. That he's leading, which is a lot. <laughs> a lot. Yeah. Church of about 4,000, okay. staff of about 30. Yeah. It's a lot. And a two week break. And his, him and his dad were close. Yeah. Yeah. His dad was like his best friend and his mentor. Yeah. His dad was an incredible man. Really, mm. really just incredible man. So it was wow. a great, great loss. Yeah. Yeah. It was a great loss. And so, like, I'm sure you have asked yourself at times and anybody who hears the story as it plays out will, would ask like, what, what happened? You know, like what, what happened in the middle of all of his and Andrew journey? began to exp- Oh, wait, I'm so oh. sorry, Kayla, you're cutting out That's one minute. Okay. We'll let it, hold on one minute. My internet connection is unstable. Are we good? That's now? okay. Okay, hold on one minute. I don't want to miss anything you have to say. <laughs> That's all right. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, okay. It's not my internet, right? That. My internet's nope. okay. Nope, you're good. I think it's mine. Okay. We have we have like okay. 40, 40 interns here at the church, and they love to hop on our Wi-Fi. <laughs> oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, anyways, though, as far as just like looking back, like what happened along that way, mm-hmm. along that journey that landed you where you, where you were a year, what it was, is it now a year and a half ago? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So in the fall of 2017, Andrew began to experience panic attacks and we had a stalker Mm -hmm. issue in our family that just really triggered the sense of fear in Andrew. And so just a panic attack or had a panic attack, like, you know, that the person literally feels like they're going to die. Sure. Um, it's he phys- would have it's ex- so physical. It's very physical. Mm-hmm. And he would have extreme chest pain and he would like do anything he could to get it to go away. He'd be pacing around our bedroom. He'd be like standing with the fridge open because someone like recommended that. I mean, mm-hmm. curled up in a ball in the fetal position on the floor, like rocking himself. Like he would try anything and everything to get them to go away. And it would be hours and hours. And they mostly happen at night. So it'd be hours and hours he'd be up throughout the night dealing with these panic attacks. So as a wife, like this person you love, you're watching Mm -hmm. like visibly go through horrific, traumatic panic attacks. Are you alarmed at this point? Yeah. So at first we actually thought that it was his thyroid. Mm Mm-hmm. He had struggled with hyperthyroid issues in the past. So we thought, you know, maybe this is just a flare up. Like maybe this is an easy fix. And so we were seeing doctors and doing blood work and trying to figure out if it was his thyroid and his panic attacks actually started getting worse instead of getting better. And the doctors ruled out that it, it wasn't his thyroid and um, his panic attacks continued to get worse. So he actually ended up in the hospital 
after another huge panic attack. And they ran even more tests at the hospital to further just decide that it wasn't his thyroid. And they cleared it all out. And they, and that's when we decided, you know, like this guy just needs to rest. Like if it's not his thyroid, then like what is going on in his body? Like what, we, we can't live like this. He can't yeah. live like this. Like this is miserable for everybody. He's exhausted. Yeah. Like we can't, our family can't handle this. Our marriage can't handle this. Like this is too much. Yeah. So we put him on a sabbatical in April of 2018 and about two weeks into the sabbatical, he was diagnosed with depression. Mm. And um, I'll never forget sitting in the office with him when he was diagnosed and I was shocked. I was stunned. Um, The doctor looked at me and said those words, your husband has depression. And I was so shocked and stunned that I didn't say anything. We just walked out to the car and got in the car and I just started crying. Yeah. And, I, and I turned to Andrew and I said, how did we end up here? Like this strong, resilient man that had led our family and led our church through so much. Like how did he end up with depression? Like this wasn't supposed to happen to him. And, act- and Andrew was actually relieved to have a diagnosis. He was relieved yeah. to, fi- to finally know what was going on inside of his body because he had been suffering for so long. So, mm-hmm. so we started treating the depression and he was on medication and he was resting and we were doing everything we knew to do to get him better. He yeah. was seeing the, the psychiatrist every other week. We were seeing a therapist together for two hours every week. Mm-hmm. He went on solo trips by himself to go spend time with God and solitude and pray and catch God's vision for his life. And we went on a two week road trip together, just the two of us, which is so hard to do when you have a house full of kids, you know, to get away for that long. Right. We were really trying everything Mm -hmm. to get him better. And Mm -hmm. the doctors actually thought that he was getting better. They had diagnosed Mm -hmm. him on the low end of the spectrum. Like they were so confident with rest and the right medication and time that he would be back to work in no time and that he would be feeling better in no time. So towards the end of July, the doctors actually thought that going back to work would be the next right step in his healing process. They mm. thought that too much time away from work could actually make his depression worse. Mm. So Andrew returned to work August 1st of 2018 and he was excited. Like I'll never forget um, sitting in the therapist office with him, just processing him going back to work and him explaining to the therapist what it felt like for him to like put on work clothes to put on like a button down wow. shirt and like nice. And shoes it was a good and feeling. Pants and how he was just, yeah, he was crying and he just was so like, wow. just so excited to be back oh. and so excited to, to be healthy and to wow. be better. And he wanted his life back. You know, mm-hmm. he hated because he's such a driven man. He hated that all of this was slowing him down and taking him away from what he knew he was called to do. Yeah. So he returned to work and he was excited and he had this series called Hot Mess that he was Mm. so excited to preach. And the series was all about mental illness. And he knew, you know, not a lot of churches were talking about mental illness. He was really excited to be kind of a front runner in that. And um, the church was like thrilled to, you know, the first weekend he was back, they gave him a standing ovation. People were sitting on the floor, like the church was packed out. It was a full house. They were so excited that he was back. And he gave, um, he did that weekend and then did another weekend. And they were both very powerful messages about suicide and depression Mm. and and mental health. Like he gave out the statistics. He gave out the suicide hotline number. He gave out facts from the NAMI website. Like he had done his research and he knew, you know, all the right answers and all the facts and all the stats. And Unfortunately, headed into the third weekend, he just had a really awful day in the office Mm -hmm. and his mind was still broken and his mind wasn't fully healed. And he knew that like he felt like he was 65% returning Mm -hmm. to work and he was, you know, very confident he would get back to 100% and that he would ease back into ministry. But this day, his, his broken mind just wasn't able to process the information he was receiving. And so he had a mental breakdown and... Mm -hmm. Um, we tried, you know, we surrounded him and we tried to comfort him and tried to talk him through it. And unfortunately the next morning, as we were helping from a distance, um, he attempted suicide and we were completely shocked and completely stunned. And like, here's this man that's returning to work and talking about mental illness. Like he's talking about depression. He's talking about suicide. He gave out the suicide hotline number. Like Mm -hmm. if anyone would have known where to go for help, it was him. 
So we were just completely shocked and rattled and stunned. And he ended up in the hospital. And I'll never forget laying on this little hospital bed with him, holding him and begging God for a miracle and telling God, like, this just happened to our family. We just watched his dad pass away. Our church just lost a pastor. Like, this cannot happen again. Like, not Andrew. Like, not not another pastor. Like, this, like, this cannot be happening. And we're begging God for a miracle. And we're begging God to bring him back. And yeah. unfortunately, the doctors ran a bunch of tests. And they just concluded there was nothing that they could do to help. So on August 25th, 2018, Andrew took his last breath and Mm -hmm. went to be with Jesus. And I'm still shocked and I'm still stunned and I'm still rattled and I still cannot believe that suicide happened to him. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard you mention before, because I've just followed your journey, that you've talked about the difference between the terms Dying, dying by suicide, suicide, and committing suicide. Mm-hmm. Could you unpack that for just like what? I just think it's such an important thing to recognize that suicide oftentimes really is not a choice. Yeah, yeah. So I've learned, you know, through I, through this whole process, so much about mental illness and mental health and suicide and. I quickly learned that saying the phrase committed suicide or chose to kill themselves, Mm -hmm. it's just the wrong phrase to use when you're talking about suicide. Mm -hmm. The word committed is a word we attach to phrases like committed a crime or committed murder or committed Mm -hmm. sin. Like if someone had a heart condition and had a heart attack, you wouldn't say they committed a heart attack, right? Like dying by suicide is the same. And so when we, and so instead of saying committed suicide, we we choose to say died by suicide suicide and it puts the suicide in its right place. Mm. Um, Suicide was a result of an underlying physical illness. And Mm -hmm. so saying die by suicide is the appropriate way to, to uh, just approach it. And it, and it, it's just full of grace and empathy for that person, you know, like it's, I don't blame Andrew and I don't think it was his fault. And I think if he was sitting here today, he would want to redo and he would be wishing that hadn't happened. Like, I so believe that in that moment, he was so out of his mind that it just Mm -hmm. wasn't him. It wasn't him. He was sick and his mind was broken. Yeah. So for anybody who loves someone walking through um, mental illness, broken mind, a, a, a real thing that's happening, like having been through your journey, what would you say how do you support somebody walking through some, some of these really extreme feelings, brokenness, and oftentimes very like biochem? Yeah. Yeah. Things. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot. I mean, walking alongside somebody that's struggling with their mental health is hard. Like I was right there in the trenches of it for only like four months and I was completely exhausted. I'm also chasing three little boys. So (laughs) I was just completely exhausted. And I would say um, the best way to treat mental illness is to treat it as a team. And so that means, you know, it's you, it's family members, it's doctors, it's therapists, it's, you can't um, treat mental health by yourself. And you can't just have one person supporting the person that has Mm -hmm. mental illness. Like, it has to be team. It's and good, yeah. and I think also giving yourself, if you're in the trenches walking alongside somebody, like give yourself a lot of breaks and give yourself a lot of rest. Like mm-hmm. you're pouring out so much and you can only keep pouring out if you keep filling yourself up. So mm-hmm. taking time, like schedule the babysitter and go sit at the spa for the day or go sit at the beach for the day or just go take a nap somewhere. Like make sure that you're um, taking care of yourself so you can continue to take care of the person that you love yeah and I would say reach out for professional help like and and treat the professional help as a team as well like go with the go with the person to every single doctor's appointment and every single therapist appointment and help them advocate for their own health Mm -hmm. a lot of the times 
someone that's sick isn't able to articulate how they're feeling because their mind is sick. So being able to be there and be a voice for them and really tell the doctors what's really going on and not being afraid to tell the truth and not shying away from the truth, but being very real and authentic and transparent with the professionals so they know what the home life is really like. Mm. I think a lot of the times there's just so much shame surrounding all of it. Yes. That we're afraid to be honest. That yeah. we're afraid to say our our loved one told me they wanted to kill themselves. Like yeah. we're we're afraid to go there. We're afraid to say it out loud, especially when it comes to suicide. So I think just um, letting go of that shame and being willing to do whatever it takes to advocate for the person that you love and to take any thoughts of suicide seriously like even if you think they would never do it like I I thought Andrew would never do it he mentioned it one time to me and it was like a passing thought and I truly deeply in my core believed he would never do it and he's telling me he would never do it and then here I am today and it happened and so I think um taking any thoughts of suicide seriously like they have to be taken seriously and And when someone shares those deep, dark thoughts with you, it's like leaning in and listening and asking lots of questions. Like questions are so powerful. Questions like, do you have a suicide plan? Like Mm -hmm. when and where and how would you do it? What problem are you trying to solve through suicide? Mm -hmm. Like asking very specific intentional questions to get them to open up and maybe it even offers solutions they hadn't thought about before. And so leaning in and having empathy and asking questions and then just taking care of yourself so that you can keep pouring out and treating it as a team, like all those things are so important when it comes to mental health and find a really incredible therapist. And if you're the loved one that's walking alongside, like make sure you schedule therapy appointments by yourself Mm. to just to go and vent and be real, especially if you're in ministry, it can be Mm. so hard because you don't want your friends to think the pastor's struggling. Mm -hmm. So to have a safe space where you can tell the counselor how they're really doing and what's really going on, and you can process all your own feelings Mm -hmm. in that safe space. Like, I think that's so important and something that I wish I would have done more. I wish I would have gone to the counselor by myself rather than just going with him. Mm -hmm. And I wish he would have gone by himself too. I think it's all three, like doing individual sessions and also doing sessions together. That's really good. We have families in our church, even today, walking through similar situations. And so I just, I'm just so grateful for your perspective, for your hindsight, for your openness. In the middle of all of this, you have three baby boys. I mean, not really babies, but you have to be you. I'm sure they'll always be babies, right? (laughs) You've got, Mm. you've got three boys. So you, I can imagine like you lose, you lose him. Andrew, and then you've got to keep going for your boys. How did you walk through your own grief? And then if you don't, and if you, I can cut anything, obviously, and I'm happy to edit yeah. anything, but I would, how did you talk to your boys about it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I actually, I waited a week. Uh-huh. Um, I stayed with my brother-in-law for a week and thankfully my dad and his wife were able to take time off work and they just kept my boys at their house. And the boys knew that their daddy wasn't well and knew their daddy was in the hospital and knew mommy was taking care of daddy. And so I waited a week and I talked to the right people. I talked to child life specialists and I did some research and I wanted to make sure that the way that I explained it to them was the right way. Mm -hmm. So I waited a week and then I actually, um, before they came back to the house, I cleared out all of his stuff. Um, That was just a personal decision. Everybody does that differently. But for me, like I wanted what I was sharing with them to match our environment. Yeah. And so I, which was really hard, but I had a lot of people helping me, which was great. So we packed up all of his stuff and then the boys came home and I sat them down on the couch and I just told them, you know, you know how daddy's been sick and you know how daddy's been going to the doctor a lot and you know how daddy's been resting a lot. And I said, well, daddy got really, really sick and he ended up in the hospital and daddy did something that caused him to die. And um, now daddy's in heaven and daddy died and now he's with Jesus and with Papa and Mm -hmm. we'll get to see him again one day. 
And it was just, I mean, out of body, surreal. That's like yeah. everybody's worst nightmare. I never imagined that I would be sitting with my three boys, looking at their big, beautiful blue eyes, breaking mm-hmm. their hearts, right. you know, telling them that their daddy's not coming home. And they all processed it differently. And the child life specialist had prepared us for that. So my two younger boys, they were two and four at the time. Mm -hmm. They just went outside and played. And um, we were told, you know, a lot of kids process through play. So they just went outside and played. And Mm -hmm. my older son, he was five. He just, he uh, walked into the kitchen to throw something away. and And I followed him and he just turned around and broke down and Mm -hmm. he's older and he's kind of an old soul. Like I explain, I explain him as like a 70 year old man trapped (laughs) in a seven year old's body. Like he just has this old, beautiful soul and he had already lost his papa and he was very, very close to his papa. And Mm -hmm. he knew that papa didn't come back. So he knew what that meant. He knew, you know, when I was telling him daddy died, that daddy wasn't coming back. And so it just hit him completely differently than it did the other two kids. Um, but God was so near even in that day and in that moment, um, me colored in this coloring book someone had given us that was called when someone I love dies. Mm. And um, the first page we were coloring, it was talking about the life cycle of a caterpillar and how it goes from an egg to a caterpillar to a cocoon into a butterfly. And it was comparing that to grief and death and life. And so we're sitting there and we're coloring this and we finish up and it's time for the boys to take a nap. So I went over and I closed the curtains in the living room and right where I placed my hand on the curtain, there was this little tiny green caterpillar which was so special because we had just colored in this coloring book together. And so I pulled it off the curtain and I showed my son Smith and he said out loud, it's a miracle from God. Like without me even prompting him, like he just, he just knew like, so it was so special. Like God gave us a miracle in that moment, this size that my son Smith could understand. Mm -hmm. And God's just continued to do that for us, like left and right throughout the grieving process from a little tiny caterpillar to a beautiful home, you know, that we get to live in to an incredible Mm -hmm. school that my boys get to go to, to just the support um, worldwide from the big C church worldwide and from people worldwide. And also the support from our close knit friends and community. Like we've literally been held up by the hands of God and also just by our community. And God has been so kind to us. And I've cried equal tears over the goodness of God wow. as I have over the death of my husband. Wow. Wow. Um, I know your, I would, or I would, I guess I should say, I would imagine that your goal on the journey that you're walking now is to honor him and his life and advocate for other people who are walking through what he did. Did you ever dream that this would be what you'd be doing? Never in a million years. No, you know, I'm, I'm living a completely different life. My whole entire life that I was living with Andrew died with Andrew. Mm-hmm. And so I I explain it as I'm rebuilding, I I call it rebuilding beautiful and I'm Mm -hmm. rebuilding this new life. And from the ground up, from the dust, from rock bottom, I'm building this new life. And I never, you know, imagined that I'd be the one that would be the mouthpiece. Like Andrew was the mouthpiece. Andrew sat in the driver's seat and he was driving our family and he had vision and he knew where he was headed and I just got to be along for the ride. Mm -hmm. And so I went from the passenger seat to the driver's seat and I'm looking out at the horizon and I have no idea what I'm doing and I have no idea where I'm going. And Mm -hmm. the rest of our journey is such a huge question mark. Um, And so I'm just leaning into God along the way and, and, and walking through the doors that he's opened and the opportunities he's presented our family with and trying to say yes to the things that are good and yes to the things that spread awareness for mental health and Mm -hmm. yes to the things that honor Andrew and yes to my boys and leading them, you know, through this and loving them well and being Mm -hmm. present for them and, and yes to the grief and running to the grief and sitting in the grief and making sure that like I'm, I am um, taking this time and and stewarding this time wisely. 
and that I'm really truly giving the grief the attention and respect and time that it deserves. Mm. And so, no, I never imagined I would be sitting, you know, and I'm sitting in my backyard at this little house that I never thought I would be living in and I'm living in a town I never thought I'd be living in. Mm. And, and I just, I never would have imagined this would be my life in a million different ways. Mm -hmm. So what empowers you? Because from the outside, so many people I'm sure tell you what I've told you, you're so strong, you're so brave, you've overcome so much. How do you keep going? How do you not only deal with your own personal grief, but become a mouthpiece, an advocate in the Mm -hmm. Christian church for mental health, which has been so tabooed for so long. And I feel like you are a true like pioneer front runner in this entire movement that is sweeping Christianity in the best way possible. Um, but you're, I would imagine still really sad. Mm -hmm. And how do you, how do you do what you're doing with the strength that you're doing it with while still navigating your own sadness? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all God. Like to really? be completely yeah. honest, yeah. like yeah. it really is this like deep inner strength that only comes from God. And I couldn't do anything that I'm doing without God. And I truly deeply know that even like the giftings, like I was not the communicator. I like rarely did an announcement on stage really? with my husband. Like it was not just wasn't what I felt called to. And it wasn't something Mm -hmm. that I had a big desire. Like I never desired to be the person talking into a microphone on the stage. And, Mm -hmm. and so just the gifts that God has given me in grief and the way that he is using my voice because of the way I was before, I just know like hands down, it's all God. Like it was, it was just not who I was before. And so the writing and the speaking, like it all just comes from God. And it also comes from this place of like, I hate what happened to Andrew and I hate what happened to our family. So it comes from this place of like wanting to help and this burning fire that I have inside of wanting to stop this from happening to other people and doing the best I can to play a small part in a bigger conversation and helping this from happening to other beautiful people like Andrew. Mm -hmm. So it's that fire and that passion and that almost like injustice, you know, like this this feels like an injustice what happened to Andrew. So it's like fighting for justice and fighting for, for people, for freedom, for people that are sitting Mm -hmm. in the darkness and just educating all of us. Like there's so much that I wish I would have known that now I know that I wish I would have known when I was walking through it with Andrew Mm -hmm. And so just helping people understand what mental illness is, what mental illness isn't, what helps and what doesn't help. And I'm not an expert, but I've lost the love of my life. So I have just all this life experience now and this and this new knowledge as I'm investigating and wanting to learn more. And, and God has just continued to open doors for me to do all of that. I haven't had to pursue a single opportunity. They've all just kind of fell into my lap. Mm. How would you break down seen so it's really walking through those open doors yeah Yeah. totally um how would you break down seeing what you've seen and now learning what you've learned the tension of spiritually what's happening and then physically and biologically what's happening does that make sense and when you Mm -hmm. throw theology on top of all of it Mm -hmm. um I don't know. Does that make sense? Like, how would you break that down and kind of explain? Because I think sometimes it's just like, if you, if you just fast some more, (laughs) right. Mm -hmm, If you just mm -hmm. prayed some more, then it'll all go away. And Mm -hmm. I think anybody who's walked this journey will know that's not always the case Mm -hmm. Speak to the person who just thinks you should just spend an extra 30 minutes in prayer. Does that, you know, it's just, it's such a real battle for any Christian that's facing this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's no one size fits all approach when it comes to mental health. There's just not like period, end of story, like what works for one person may not work for another person. And it's all gray. It's not black and white. Like sometimes medications work and sometimes they make it worse. And sometimes therapy is healing and people find healing in that. And sometimes they don't. And sometimes exercise and like changing your diet can be incredibly helpful. And other times it's not like 
what works for you may not work for me. And so I think when it comes to mental illness, it's knowing that it's not the result of an underlying sin issue mm. and it's not a choice. And it's, it's not something that people can just shrug off and make go away. Like it's a real chemical imbalance. It's a real physical illness. Something is really happening inside of the brain that's causing it to malfunction. And so treating it like we treat any other illness, like if someone had cancer yeah. and they were, you know, doing chemotherapy and, and they were getting seeking treatment for that, like we would be full of empathy and full of grace yep. and wanting to help and showing up at their front door with meals yeah. and doing all those things. And I think when it comes to mental health, we just, we just don't understand it. And so yeah. we either like back off completely or, or, or we think that it's, that's, it's their fault that they decided this or they're just being lazy or they're not praying enough. Like we have all these assumptions when the truth is we have no idea. Yeah. We have no idea what it's like, what it's like to walk in anybody else's shoes, but our own. And we have no idea what it's like to live with a mental illness that somebody else is living with. Like mm. we truly just have no idea. So it's, it's supporting people and coming alongside people that are struggling with their mental health. And just like we would come alongside somebody that had any other physical illness. It's showing up at their front door. It's calling until they answer. It's inviting them, including them, reaching out to them until they get better. It's being there for them, you know, the hands and feet of Jesus and just being love in action and love with skin on and continuing to pursue them. Even when they're sitting in the deepest depression and they're never, they're not texting you back and they're not answering the door mm -hmm. and they're not, you know, picking up the phone, like continuing to pursue them and continuing to show up for them, continuing to help them fight for their own health. Mm -hmm. That's so good, Kayla. This is just so needed. Your voice is so crucial, so vital to the times. And I'm just cannot wait to see what God does with you and your story. And I guess in closing, like going back to Andrew's life, like he was a wonderful man, obviously a wonderful Christian, a wonderful husband, loved his kids. I've seen your posts on Instagram, you know, like him with the boys and mm -hmm. all these different things. Um, do you think in that moment he really wanted, like, I guess what I'm asking is like, do you think death is what he really wanted? No, I think he wanted his pain to end. And that's yeah. the lie. That's the lie of suicide. Suicide dangles the carrot and says, you know, I'll make your pain go away. But actually all that it does is take your pain and place it into the laps of all the people that you love. And me and the boys and his family and his friends, like we're all going to live with the pain of his death for the rest of our lives. Mm -hmm. And I don't think Andrew wanted to die. And I think he would be absolutely heartbroken if he was sitting here today and watching, you know, like a fly on the wall, watching our yeah. family keep going on without him. And, and if he could see everything that he's missing out on, even the boys and how much they've grown since he passed away, like he is missing out on so much. And I know that if he was here, he would want a redo and he did not want to die. He just was sick of the pain and wanted the pain to go away. Mm -hmm. But that was not, Suicide is not a solution. It's just not, it's just not a solution to ending your pain. It's, it's all a lie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so this is a really like intimate thing you've walked through. Why are you so open about it? Like, why are you so willing to speak so transparently? I'm just trying to picture myself, like what, like the, the layers of emotions, the layers of, you know, grief and you have chosen to speak so openly about it. What is the, is the motivation behind that? Are you thinking about what he would want? Are you thinking about what he suffered that you don't want others? Just like, what is, what's, what's fueling your journey? Cause you're, you've got a real grit about you <laughs> as sweet and soft as your voice sounds like there's some real grit. Like I'm from Texas. So <laughs> that's a, that's a Texas word, but there's some real strength there. Mm -hmm. What, what causes you to be able to open up these like super just personal parts of your life with literally at this point, the world, or at least the Christian world, mm -hmm. like almost, I mean, it is, you, you have been more than willing to say hard things. Mm -hmm. Why? Mm -hmm. 
It's just been this natural thing that's happened in my own journey. You know, it's not, it's not something I, I really chose to do, but it's been something that I've continued to choose to do. Like I wrote him this letter just a couple days after he passed away. I wrote him this letter that we posted to our family blog, uh, godsgotthis.com, that we had actually started when his dad was diagnosed with leukemia as a way to communicate the leukemia journey with our church. And so it was closure for me. And also like I watched, I knew the story was going viral. And so I, it was my way of like saying goodbye and also saying, I'm sorry. And also like not putting the blame on him and yeah. like, t- like really, I, I wanted to stand up for him. I didn't want his life to be defined by the way he died. I wanted his life to be defined by the way that he lived. And so right. I just wrote this letter and the letter went viral and I saw the messages that came in and the emails that came in and the texts that came in. And like one little letter that I wrote to my husband was saving lives, was saving people's lives. Literally. Literally saving people's lives and like stopping people from dying by suicide and, and giving people a reason to stay. And so I just kept talking about it and I've kept talking about it. And it's like this, um, deep, deep desire to, to help, like I said earlier, to help prevent this from happening to other people. And just this deep, deep compassion and empathy that I have, like deep in my soul for people. I have this deep love and grace and um, empathy for people that are hurting. And so I just want to love on people and remind people that they're not alone. Like, mm-hmm. breathing journal like I it's very raw it's very real it's like I share these in the moment grief little snippets of uh, what it looks like to walk through pain so I think it's also like reminding people because if you haven't walked through pain and you haven't lost something that you truly love like you really just don't understand Mm -hmm. and so it's also giving people just a little little slice of understanding of what it's like for people who are hurting to live out their grief and to walk out their grief and to walk out the every day. And I think it has helped people to like see that grief doesn't just go away, Mm -hmm. that you move forward with grief, that you never move on from grief, but you move forward with it Mm -hmm. and you have to choose to build a beautiful life around it, but it'll always be there. You know, even a year later, yeah. We we just we just placed his headstone a, a few weeks ago and this huge ginormous wave of grief just crashed over mm-hmm. me. So it doesn't just go away and there's things that unearth it and there's waves that are going to come and it's going to be this lifelong thing. So I think I just wanted to help um, give people some perspective on mental health and on grief. And it's just been something that's happened very naturally mm-hmm. and if I, if someone would have asked me before Andrew died, I, I probably wouldn't have said I would have responded the way that I have. I probably mm-hmm. would be surprised by the way that mm-hmm. I've responded. Um, but really, that's just been a lot of the Holy Spirit's prompting in, in my own soul and my own heart. And a lot of it are like these moments that I feel like I can't not share. Mm-hmm. Like I have to share this moment and I have to say this thing and this bigger goal of it literally reaching into someone's darkness and like pulling them into the light. Yeah. Do you ever think about if Andrew saw you now, like what he would think of what you're doing? Yeah, I think he would be really, really surprised. I think he um, would be really proud of me. I think he'd be really proud of his boys and of our family and of the church. And I think that he would be shocked to see me talking into a microphone Mm -hmm. on stages and, you know, and being willing to be vulnerable and open and and to be making decisions for our family too, like buying a home and buying a car and putting the boys in a different school, like making all those decisions by myself. I think he would be really, really proud of me. I think he'd be really, really proud of his boys. Mm -hmm. And I just imagine him with a big smile on his face and um, just love, you know, the love that he would have for us too. And I, and I can't wait to see that big smile and his big blue eyes again soon because life is so short if 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 anything I've learned from any of this it's truly like I know we say that flippantly but like it's just so true like I never imagined I'd be standing at my husband's graveside at 30 years old 
And he would have never imagined that he'd be gone at 30 years old. Like life is so stinking short. Mm -hmm. So we have to do our best to love people well, love people where they're at and just make our mark in the short Mm -hmm. time that we have. And I think Mm -hmm. he'd be proud of me in the way that I'm making my mark. That's so good. So you didn't know you were as strong as you, you were. (laughs) Mm -hmm. No idea. Wow. Well, Kayla, thank you so much. Like, I just can't thank you enough for sharing your story. Thank you for sharing about Andrew and his life. And clearly he is such an amazing man. And your boys, how are they? Are they good? Yeah, my boys are so resilient. They have their moments where they miss their daddy and they cry. And we talk about him all the time. Grief is just part of who we are as a family. And so Mm -hmm. we talk about him all the time. We have pictures of him in the house and they ask to go to the cemetery sometimes and overall like you really wouldn't know unless you knew or unless Mm -hmm. they told you about it they're so strong and they're so fun and they're so full of life and wonder and curiosity and they keep me going they keep me up early in the morning they keep me seeking joy and seeking fun and seeking Mm -hmm. play and I can't imagine walking through this grief journey without them. They're three beautiful gifts from God that that are really carrying me through my grief too. And and they're doing great. They're in a great school. They're loved by great friends and mm-hmm. great teachers. And they really are doing well. It's going to be such a lifelong process and journey sure. for them. But at sure. this age right now, they're, they're doing all right. That's so good. Well, you're an amazing woman. Um, what's your website? God's got this, right? Dot com. Yep. Yep. Okay. So for people who want to follow your journey, they can follow on Instagram mm-hmm. and God's got this.com. Yep. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Kayla, for real. Like, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bless you and those sweet boys. And hopefully those bathrooms get done soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Jamie. It's and been such a joy nice, to chat with you. A nice soak. <laughs> yes. I can't wait. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> and just know that there is a army of people loving you, cheering you on, and honestly really admiring you. Like, thank you real. so much. Like there's so, thank you. There are so many people and I just thank you for sharing your story with my people. So God's got this and hopefully we can have you in live one of these years. Yeah. That'd Bring be the great. boys and they can play in, play in our pool. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. We love it. Thanks, Thanks so much, Jamie. God bless you. you.